Hi, and welcome to the fifth dialogue of U.S.-Japan Council's Japanese American and Japan Legacy Series. I'm Deborah Nakatomi. Diane Fukami and I are your hosts for this series, highlighting the lives and journeys of prominent Japanese American leaders who are pioneers in developing the U.S.-Japan relationship. Through their stories, we explore the role of Japanese Americans in strengthening U.S.-Japan relations and how their experiences with Japan have contributed to their Japanese American identity and our community. We'd like to thank the US Japan Council for providing this opportunity to share these unique and powerful stories. We would also like to thank our friends at Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs for their invaluable support of this program and of Japanese American leaders to nurture the US Japan relationship. Today, we are excited to welcome Dan Okimoto, Professor Emeritus at Stanford University, co-chairman of the Silicon Valley Japan Platform and member of the USJC Board of Counselors. Today is a special double feature. This interview will be followed by an interview with James Higa, managing partner of Offline Ventures. And uh, you can tune in on YouTube Premiere, and the link will be available in the chat box at the conclusion of this program, so you can link right directly into James's interview. In these back-to-back -back interviews, we will hear their unique stories and perspectives on the evolution of the U.S.-Japan bilateral relationship in business and technology through their unique experiences in Japan and the Silicon Valley. We will reserve time for a few questions following our interview with Dan Okimoto, so please place your questions in chat during the program. So Dan, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are so happy to have you with us, and we'd like to get started um, at the very beginning. So please share with us uh, the story of your parents, as well as some of the early memories of your childhood. And well, we have some great photos to share also as you, you go throughout your story. Yes, thank you. I am delighted to have this opportunity. Two of my favorite media gurus, Deborah and Diane, uh, this will be a lot of fun. So there were <clears throat> several events that happened prior to my birth over which I had absolutely no control and which had an enormous formative impact on my life. The first was the uh, Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor and the second, uh, the coming of the Second World War. The second event was the incarceration of Japanese Americans on the West Coast into uh, assembly centers and wartime internment camps. And the third was my birth to uh, Japanese immigrants, um, both ordained Christian ministers. Uh, my mother from uh, Fukuoka, Japan. My father from Yamaguchi, uh, Japan. Um, the fact that I was uh, born in the United States of Japanese immigrant parents um, set the parameters of my personal and professional life. Um, and let me talk first about uh, my parents. My mother was the youngest of six children uh, who grew up in a farming village in uh, Fukuoka, Japan. She was um, a school teacher uh, in spite of the fact that she grew up in a farming family. She went to college and got her teaching credentials and uh, was a teacher in Fukuoka. Uh, she was a um, very loving and warm, uh, generous, spirited, uh, caring individual. Uh, I, you know, of course, children are apt to exaggerate uh, the qualities of their parents, but I've never encountered a person in my life with uh, warmth and uh, generosity of spirit that my mother had. And I owe a great deal to her uh, <laughs> in the time that we had together. Uh, she went to study 
uh, English uh, in Hawaii when she was uh, just out of college. And um, there she, her father passed away in Japan, which was a, a traumatic shock to her. And she became a Christian uh, in the aftermath of that trauma. Um, and uh, my father, who was born in Yamaguchi Prefecture, grew up in a, uh, a difficult childhood. Um, <clears throat> her parent, uh, his parents uh, got divorced almost as soon as he was born uh, because the mother of my grandfather was not pleased with the daughter-in-law, my grandmother, and so sent her away. And my father grew up um, in a household um, where he was the eldest child with um, four or five uh, half brothers and sisters in a second marriage. Uh, his stepmother was uh, distant, um, cold, and um, so he grew up uh, <clears throat> in a difficult environment with a uh, hot temper. I mean, he had a a scary temper to me because it was like thunder and lightning. When he got angry, it was like a flash of lightning and he just exploded. And uh, I was uh, scared of him uh, growing up. Uh, my mother was just the opposite, you know, the <laughs> epitome of calmness and <laughs> gentleness. Um, so I, I had a quite an interesting uh, contrast in the emotional disposition of my parents. But they were all, uh, they were both really devoted to our family, extremely hardworking, uh, very religious, um, and devoted to um, making a good life for the children and wanting the children to be decent uh, uh, citizens of the United States. Um, so I owe a great deal to both of them. And um, uh, I was born in August of 1942, about nine months after Pearl Harbor. And if my parents had known about Pearl Harbor, see, I may have never been conceived because it's hard to imagine parents uh, having children when the Pacific War had broken out and the future of Japanese Americans in the United States was so uncertain. So the fact that I was born just before, conceived just before Pearl Harbor um, was probably quite significant from a standpoint that I may not be here if <laughs> it had happened after uh, Pearl Harbor. That photo that we saw, you were the youngest of the boys. Yes. You're the third son. So yes. you were the little one. Yes, I was the uh, youngest uh, spoiled child out of the family of four. Um, my oldest brother, Paul, we were all named after Christian uh, figures in the Bible. Uh, that's the other interesting part of our upbringing. Uh, we were really grounded in uh, the Judeo-Hebrew tradition because of the Christian faith of my parents. And so the United States really felt like our home, our natural home because of our Christian upbringing. And, you know, I was required to read the Bible twice a day when I got up in the morning for 30 minutes, when I went to bed, uh, 30 minutes. And, um, I uh, had a very strong, I, I must have read the Bible in my, before I got, went to college six or seven times and uh, discussed every chapter with my parents. So uh, we had a, a grounding in the United States, but then most of my exposure at camp, all of my exposure at camp were with Issei and Nisei. So I grew up in an environment where I only saw Japanese American faces. And with the Issei, I heard Japanese. Uh, and with the Nisei, I heard English. But 
my world, my cognitive world was uh, shaped really uh, in the camp for the first three years of my life, seeing nothing but fellow Japanese Americans. So my, <laughs> my cerebral structure, my brain structure, which is uh, formed during the first three years of uh, life was deeply formed, I think, by my experience at uh, Poston, uh, Arizona. So even today, um, I have a kind of instinctual affinity uh, for the company of Japanese Americans. And <laughs> I'm surprised even when I'm in Tokyo from a distance in the Tokyo train station with tens of thousands of people milling around, I can usually spot a Japanese American <laughs> somewhere in the crowd. And uh, so I was uh, deeply shaped by that experience in uh, Poston. Yeah, so <laughs> post-war, after the war, you uh, and your family settled in Pasadena. Yes, yes. And that's and, where uh, your home was for many years. Yes, we actually went from uh, Poston to San Diego for a couple of years, which were which was the home of my parents and family before the war. And uh, we lived in, uh, in the African-American section of, Pas of uh, San Diego. And uh, then we moved to San Lorenzo, a rural community in Northern California, where uh, there were many Japanese Americans in the uh, nursery business, the flower nursery business. And uh, I grew up in this rural community in the 1940s and 50s, um, population maybe 10 to 15,000. And um, <clears throat> because my mother had uh, been diagnosed with colon cancer and had an operation, uh, that was one reason we moved to Pasadena because the doctors had suggested that she get uh, medical treatment uh, at the City of Hope. Um, so we moved from uh, San Lorenzo to Pasadena. It was the first time that I lived in a WASP middle-class community. I mean, everything about Pasadena <laughs> was a tremendous uh, adjustment for me. Uh, first of all, we owned a home. We bought a home for $14,500, which is exorbitant price at that time to our eyes. And my parents who were ordained ministers had a very low salary. So my dad had to go to work uh, uh, as a daytime gardener. And fortunately he was very handy with his hands and had a knack for gardening flowers and uh, uh, so forth. Um, and so he worked during the day, six days a week as a gardener. And uh, my brothers and I went and helped him on the weekends. Uh, and then in the evenings, he was a minister and he drove most evenings to San Fernando where he had a church uh, or Monrovia where my parents also had a church. So um, <clears throat> it was um, a white middle-class community. I had never seen such wealth in my life. And when I first saw the Wrigley Mansion in Pasadena, this stately uh, building that with the gardens took up nearly one block of Orange Grove Boulevard, the wealthiest segment of Pasadena. I was stunned. I had never imagined that there could be such wealth. And uh, my father gardened in Pasadena, Altadena, and San Marino, very wealthy communities. So <laughs> when I went around with him on weekends, grumbling most of the time because I wanted to be out with my buddies <laughs> surfing or playing basketball, um, I uh, saw a degree of wealth that uh, I hadn't imagined before. Dan, you had shared with us an incident that happened in San Marino. It involves your career aspirations about wanting to be a diplomat and how that was that was dashed. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> yes, I had a lot of uh, 
memorable moments uh, getting adjusted to Pasadena and to other uh, WASP societies uh, in the United States. So uh, at the time I was in seventh grade, um, I was uh, 12 years old and helping my father uh, at a home in San Marino. Uh, yes, this is, uh, this is not the home itself, but very similar to the home, Spanish style, rambling, beautiful home. And I was raking outside when the uh, lady of the household came out, uh, Mrs. Lynch, I remember her name very clearly, and came up uh, with a very friendly hello to me and said uh, in a rather condescending way, What's, what is your name? And I said, Daniel. And she said, oh, nice name. And she said, um, and uh, what would you like to do when you grow up? And I said, I, I don't know, uh, maybe I'd be a diplomat. And she looked so surprised. And she said, oh, to be a diplomat, you have to go to college. I said, yes, I, I'd like to do that. <laughs> and she said, where would you like to go? And because uh, Pasadena, in Pasadena was located Caltech, the great university, one of the greatest in the world. I said, oh, and also in California was located Stanford. I said, oh, oh you know, maybe Caltech or Stanford. And she looked at me and she couldn't help blurting out laughing. I mean, she must have laughed for 30 seconds. And I was standing there humiliated because I knew this was uh, uh, a laughter of condescension of your thinking of going to Stanford and you're a gardener's son, you know, you better get used to manual labor. It was sort of the attitude that was conveyed to me. And uh, when I, uh, and after she went back in the house, I was raking around the yard and on the side of the yard, I looked into the bedroom window and I saw a banner of Stanford on the wall. And uh, I thought, aha, and, uh, her kids or her uh, went to Stanford or this is a Stanford family. And I remember feeling that is this rich elite university that I'm never going to attend. Cross Stanford off my list, I'm never going there. <laughs> and uh, so when uh, I applied to college, I applied to Stanford. Uh, I applied to Stanford for college and graduate school, but I didn't go there. Um, and I really basically um, didn't want to set foot on the Stanford campus. But lo and behold, um, when I got the job offer from Stanford after I finished graduate school, I decided initially to go back east, but then I changed my mind and decided uh, California, Stanford was really where I wanted to uh, live and work. So ironically, I've spent nearly a half century now at Stanford. Uh, and so in spite of Mrs. Lynch, I have spent the bulk of my life uh, here at Stanford and I've become a huge Stanford fan uh, as a result. <laughs> life has its ironies. All right, so you end up going to not Stanford, but another school, which isn't too shabby. So tell uh, us about, tell us about yes. that experience. Yes. So, you know, um, education was a high priority for my parents and my family. Uh, they were not tiger parents. I mean, you know, they wanted us to do well in school, but they were so busy themselves uh, with their ministry and uh, my father with his gardening that they didn't have time really to uh, look over our shoulders as we were doing homework and um, follow and track the work that we were doing. I don't think my parents really even knew what I was taking in high school. And I um, almost never talked to them about which colleges I wanted to attend. I was thinking I'll either go to a public university like Cal Berkeley or UCLA, or I'll go to uh, a small private school like Pomona, 
I was uh, very, <laughs> I was enamored of Pomona and it was close to our home within a, an hour's drive. And um, I used to go there as a high school student to, uh, to see plays uh, put on by the uh, students and to hear lectures uh, by various uh, professors there. But my older brother, Joe, um, who um, had gone to Dartmouth um, and then to Harvard Medical School, told me, uh, asked me when he came home for vacation, where are you thinking of going? And I said, oh, I really want to go to Pomona. And he said, oh, don't stay on the West Coast. You've got to go to the East Coast for college. Um, and I, uh, I was surprised that he, he said that. Uh, and he said, you'll hate the East Coast. It's cold, it's competitive, it's uh, not your style. You'll feel miserable while you're there getting adjusted. But if you're going to come back and live and work in California, and even if you are not, the East Coast will help you uh, develop intellectually, professionally, personally. And uh, so I thought, oh yeah, maybe he's right. And uh, so I applied to uh, Princeton and uh, I was accepted there and given a very, almost a full scholarship. And so I was torn between Princeton and Pomona and decided that my brother was right. I should go to a place that was out of my comfort zone, which was the East Coast. And so I went to Princeton and it had a dramatic impact on my life. I mean, it really, it shaped me in a way that uh, only the internment experience uh, similarly shaped me. You know, Dan, you've talked a lot with us about just your, your awareness, your social awareness and some of the experiences that you had early on that really shaped your perception. And one of the things you talked to us about was an experience you had, I think it was when you were a junior and you went abroad for school and it involved Aikido. Oh, you yes, yes. about that yes. experience is just really yes. lightning. Okay, so uh, when I went to Princeton, you know, I was uh, intending to major in the Woodrow Wilson School of uh, International Affairs, become a diplomat. Um, and the first meeting I had with my advisor during freshman week, uh, my advisor was a Middle Eastern literature specialist. Professor Kritzik was his name. And um, he sat me down and he said, uh, I have just spent the most fascinating summer in Japan where I read Japanese literature, I met Japanese film directors and uh, literary critics and I ate Japanese food. And he said it was magical. And so he said, you should take Japanese, and you should major in Japanese studies. Oh, I was uh, astounded that he, the Middle Eastern specialist was giving me this advice. <laughs> but he was my advisor and he insisted that I enroll in beginning Japanese, which was uh, being offered for the first time in 1960 at uh, Princeton. So I enrolled in beginning Japanese. And then I started taking Japanese uh, history classes, literature classes, and I became fascinated. I mean, really it was the literature that captured my attention early. Um, I took a class on um, classical Japanese literature, read in translation, the Mayoshu, which is a collection of classical Japanese poetry and, uh, and then The Tale of Genji, uh, the first great novel in the world. And I was thinking, wow, <laughs> this is not the Japan that I thought about uh, when I was growing up. I, I really had no idea 
about the uh, tradition of uh, Japanese literature. Um, and um, so I began to be really intrigued by Japan. In high school, I had never had a single hour devoted to Japan, to Japanese history, Japanese literature, Japanese politics, economy, whatever. It was completely out of my curriculum. So that's why when I got exposed to this in college, I was so intrigued. And then in 1962, um, the Stanford Center for Japanese Studies was opened, an inner university study center in Tokyo. I applied and was accepted and uh, became a student in Tokyo. Uh, and uh, so I, <laughs> that, that, that was the cementing experience for me, living and studying in Japan for a year. And I realized then that this was a personal intellectual um, passion uh, for me. It was my way of understanding my heritage, my parents, uh, really internalizing my background in a way that uh, was so satisfying uh, to me. So uh, get back to this experience in Aikido. <laughs> uh, my freshman week at Princeton, we had a goodwill delegation from Todai come to demonstrate Aikido. And I'd never heard of Aikido uh, until that time. Uh, and uh, we had a reception. Um, and so I attended the reception and uh, sat around. I mean, I stood in a little circle talking with the captain of the Todai Aikido team. And we had a very pleasant, you know, two or three minutes of get acquainted chatter. Where are you from? And what are you studying? That, that sort of thing. And after two or three minutes, the Todai captain turns to his teammates and says in Japanese, Princeton must not be a very hard university to get into if this character got in, pointing to me. <laughs> uh, and he, he had no idea that I, could understand some Japanese, you know, I, mean, I, was a, I was a Nisei and I heard Japanese spoken around me in camp and in my family. I was taking Japanese, uh, I hadn't started much at that time. So I was so shocked that uh, he said this, um, that I um, said to him, Oshatta Tori, yes, as you say, and I turned around and walked away and he came running after me in huge humiliation, embarrassment, uh, and apology, uh, and deeply bowed and apologized for what he said. That caused me to wonder, how do Japanese think about Japanese Americans? What, I mean, what prompted this Todai guy to, after two or three minutes, uh, say something that was as demeaning <laughs> as it was. I mean, how did this guy ever get into Princeton? Um, and uh, I began thinking about that question for many years um, because I could see around me the descendants of other countries, you know, Italy or France or China or certainly Israel, uh, having their mother countries organize their descendants in the United States, but not among Japanese Americans. And I always wondered why, why didn't Japan reach out and seek to mobilize the descendants of Japanese immigrants in the United States? So Dan, um, before you go into your US Japan experiences, I wanna spend a little bit of time with Stanford because we know a lot of people are tuning in today who are very familiar with your, your career at Stanford. Yes, yes. So we wanna be sure that we touch on, um, on some of that. So you've had a very long and accomplished career at Stanford and 
I'm just kind of curious, what was the Stanford that you arrived at in the 70s? And I know that we have some really great photographs of uh, your life there, um, your, your family that we'd like to kind of also go through during some of those years um, as you're speaking. Yes. So um, when I finished uh, my PhD, or just before I finished it, I spent two years as a pre-doctoral fellow at Stanford and then a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford. So, and then of course, as I mentioned, I had uh, transferred to Stanford for one year to attend their center in Tokyo. So uh, contrary to my resolve never to go to Stanford, I, <laughs> I actually was a student there. And then I, a postdoctoral, uh, pre-doctoral and postdoctoral fellow. So I was well aware of the um, excellence of the uh, university. Um, and, you know, because I had uh, lived in California for most of my life, I wanted to live and work in California. And uh, Stanford um, uh, made me a, an offer that I, I was uh, really uh, hard put to, uh, to, to turn down. And what drew, drew me to Stanford were a number of factors. First, uh, it was a great university and rising as a university. Um, it had um, excellence in engineering and in the sciences uh, that had given rise to the cradle of Silicon Valley. So when I uh, accepted the job at Stanford in 1975, uh, Silicon Valley was emerging, uh, lifting off. And um, I could see the potential of uh, Silicon Valley in US-Japan relations. I could see its importance uh, for both the US and Japan and the world in terms of the technology, the internet, um, the computer. Uh, the tremendous transformative uh, breakthroughs that were being made in Silicon Valley. And all of the best brains in the world were flooding to Silicon Valley, to Stanford, to get their PhDs and to start new companies. So this was a dynamic that I knew was historic in nature. And uh, I wanted to be here and witness this uh, explosion of entrepreneurial and technological uh, innovation. That was the primary reason that I wanted to be at Stanford. But secondly, um, unlike the East Coast, at Princeton, in my entering class, there was one other Japanese American, two of us in a class of 800. Uh, there were four Chinese Americans. There were six Asian Americans uh, at Princeton. Uh, less than 1% uh, of the total class. At Stanford, there was an early tradition of uh, Japanese Americans in the first class at Stanford. And when I accepted the position at Stanford, already, uh, you know, roughly 12 to 15% of the classes at Stanford were Asian American very strong Asian American representation, which uh, really attracted me a lot to uh, Stanford. And uh, the final reason was, uh, you know, I had family uh, siblings in the Bay Area, and it would be great to, to live here and be uh, in proximity uh, to their homes. So for all those reasons, I chose Stanford, and it was one of the best decisions that I ever made. I mean, I had good offers from the East Coast, uh, which I am so happy I did not accept. And uh, I have had uh, nothing but uh, memorable experiences uh, at Stanford. Oh, this, this I, is a photo with your siblings? Yes. OK, uh, if I may, I will just uh, briefly explain. My brother Joe on the left here is just above me, four years older. He's the one who encouraged me to go to the East Coast. And uh, he was, uh, oh, I should mention my brother, and then my sister in the middle, who is uh, six years older than me. And 
my sister um, is the only girl in our family of four, um, was, you know, an excellent student in uh, all the way through high school. But when she um, was uh, about to graduate from high school, uh, my father said to her, uh, you cannot go to college. Uh, you have to work, go to work to support the family and support your brothers to go to college. Oh my God, what a shock that was to her. And she was devastated by that, uh, that Confucian, you know, uh, tradition, you know, the women take secondary place to the men in the, in the, in, in the household. But she uh, went to work uh, after graduating from high school got married and had three children quickly. She got married when she was uh, 19 and moved to New York City. And after she was married and her children, you know, got to be of grammar school age, she asked her husband, would it be all right if I go to night school? And he said, oh, you know, we have three kids and I got a full-time job. And I, you know, this, uh, I, I can't afford to do that. And uh, so she divorced him and took her three kids uh, and, and started to work uh, as a secretary at Mills College in the admissions department. And she went to classes at night so that she could start her college uh, education. And she worked her way to become admissions director and she really flourished. Uh, and after 10 years, uh, she got her college diploma. And that's, the, that's uh, one of the photos uh, from her college diploma. And my brother and I were so proud of her that she was able to manage, you know, raising uh, children working full time and yet going to school and finishing her BA. Well, after she finished that, <laughs> she went to work at Wells Fargo Bank and worked her way up and was the senior vice president at uh, Wells Fargo and started going to night school again to get her PhD. And I said, well, why are you doing this? You know, you, you got a great career now, Wells Fargo. And uh, she said, well, because I love to study and because I want to prove um, our dad wrong. And, uh, you know, Joe has a medical degree. You got a PhD. I'd like to get the PhD. So she went to night school <laughs> again. And I think at the grand old age of like 55, she got her PhD. And that, and, and and my brother and I again flew flew out here to uh, to attend her ceremony, and uh, we were so proud of her. But that's the, uh, you know, that's the kind of male chauvinist environment that uh, we grew up in, and uh, she really, she's done so well, and we're so proud of her uh, for what she's accomplished. Except, you know, Dan, what it shows is that the Okamoto's are very enterprising and they really maximize an opportunity. You know, one of the things that I heard about you over at Stanford is that because Stanford is sort of regarded as the Harvard of the Pacific Coast, a lot of Asian parents send their college age students to Stanford. And once they're at Stanford, everybody want, wanted to sign up for Professor Okamoto's class because they would <laughs> learn so much, especially what they would learn about is their own country and, and Japan through the eyes of an American. And that mm. perspective would be very, very valuable to them, their families, the future businesses that they might run. And so over the years, you've had hundreds of these students come to your class. You, as everybody knows, are so expert at networking and nurturing relationships. They've come through your house. They they share meals with you and your family. And then by and by a generation later, it turns out that Professor Dan Okimoto knows 
all these people around Asia who were in highly placed government positions or captains <laughs> of industry. And it all, and it started in your classroom and at your breakfast table. Talk a little bit about, about that. Well, because my parents were ministers, you know, we always had guests at our house. I mean, there was no partition month between our family and our congregation and community. And that was certainly true at uh, Post in Arizona internment camp as well. No partition month, no privacy. So <laughs> I grew up uh, with a kind of extended uh, concept of uh, family and uh, it was a joy for me, you know, and the first five years at Stanford, my salary was so low that um, uh, I qualified for actually uh, low income housing in uh, Palo Alto my first year. And then the next uh, five years, I became a resident uh, fellow of uh, faculty in residence at dormitories. So we could uh, scrimp and save money to put down money for buying a, a apartment or a home. But the pace of uh, real estate inflation was so great, you know, maybe 50% a year that we couldn't keep up with the, uh, with the valuation of uh, pro real estate in Palo Alto. So I wound up living for five years in dorm <laughs> dormitories and uh, I enjoyed it, uh, but my kids and uh, wife wanted to get out. So after five years, uh, fortunately, Stanford uh, instituted the program where they would co-invest with faculty in buying uh, homes outside of the Stanford campus. That's how it happened. But um, I've always enjoyed um, getting to know um, uh, students, getting to know colleagues and, and other people. I don't know, uh, maybe because I lived in the internment camp first three years of my life and my brain was formed there. I have this uh, fascination with people and a great um, love for people. Uh, my mother in particular was such a uh, loving, caring person. And uh, so, uh, to me, you know, what I learned in camp was um, the um, humility, the modesty, the resilience, the uh, strength of uh, Japanese Americans who were interned. And, uh, and I've said this before, but the people I admire most in my life have been the Issei farmers that I knew in camp and after we uh, got out. And my parents were had many of those Issei farmers in their churches. Uh, I've never encountered um, a more generous uh, and more um, resilient group of people uh, uh, and modest in my life. So, you know, um, I grew up admiring modesty, uh, uh, strength, resilience, determination, uh, industry. And I saw that all in the Issei farmers. Um, and in my life, you know, I've met at Stanford <laughs> so, so many Nobel Prize winners and, you know, our programs have worked with uh, heads of states, uh, US, Japan, Asia, but I really uh, there's no question the people I admire most in my life are those Issei farmers and the older Nisei soldiers who went to war uh, while their families were being incarcerated. Um, so I, I, I'm so proud of those uh, people. And um, that, that's why I, I've had this uh, desire always to meet more people. And each person is so interesting. I don't always remember their names. That's, <laughs> that's a problem. But uh, I usually remember who they are. Uh, not necessarily their names, but uh, the kind of people they were. And if I met them at Stanford, they were in my class. I usually 
remember them and have stayed in touch. So we know that you've been recognized with both the Prime Minister's commendation and also the uh, Grand Cordon Order of the Rising Sun honors from Japan. And, and given your long and deep history, your commitments uh, to fostering relationships in the way that you have, um, these honors must have been especially uh, meaningful for you. So can you reflect a little about, uh, about those honors and, and what that has meant to you? Going back to the first comment that I made, which was uh, my birth to Jap uh, Japanese immigrants and my connection both to the United States and to Japan as a result of my birth to these Japanese immigrants, I have always felt uh, blessed to have been connected to the United States and to Japan. And uh, to me, uh, I could not have chosen out of the blue two countries I would rather work with and, and for for, the, for my uh, duration of my life. Now, I have always felt ambivalence about both. Let me say that I'm extremely loyal and proud of both but I feel some ambivalence. And um, as a result of the camp experience, for example, I, I have this sense of uh, alienation, of uh, being a minority, an underdog, uh, vulnerable in the United States. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm deeply concerned by evidence of racial injust injustice, economic injustice, uh, and so forth. And uh, in Japan, uh, you know, I'm extreme, <laughs> I, I couldn't be more astounded by the recovery of Japan in the post-war period in partnership and under the auspices of an international system that the US uh, basically uh, architected. And, um, uh, when I was growing up, we used to send care packages to Japan and the label made, made in Japan was a kind of a warning uh, because it was poorly made and would break easily. Never did I realize that this country in the space of like three decades, a generation would become the second largest economy in the world from complete devastation, 40% of its uh, infrastructure destroyed uh, during the war. And by the way, you know, as, as an adult, I've always decried the fact that it was the US who dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the fire bombings on the cities, I think was unconscionable and uh, you know, 500,000 to a million civilians, innocent, elderly women and children were killed in these fire bombings. Uh, I was equally critical of uh, Japanese prisoner of war camps and, uh, you know, uh, the, the history of Japan's military expansion in the uh, Pacific. But in the post-war period, watching the two countries uh, collaborate and uh, create um, really what is the golden age of the Asia Pacific. Out of the 4,000 years of the Asia Pacific, the past 70 years have brought the world <laughs> to, and Asia to a golden age of prosperity and peace. Never in those 4,000 years have, have we had such a phenomena. Over 1.5 billion people lifted out of, out of poverty. And uh, Japan was a catalyst in Asia. Japan was the first to industrialize. And it then uh, catalyzed uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia, and now China, and down the road, India. This is really a historic awakening um, that has profound implications uh, for mankind and, and future history. Uh, it, 
if it were not for the US-Japan alliance, it's not clear when and if the Soviet Union would have capitulated in the Cold War. The Soviet Union saw the dynamism of uh, Japan and of the rest of Asia. They saw that they were falling farther and farther behind and um, the handwriting was on the wall. So, you know, when I look at it, um, really the two principal actors, well, Europe is certainly part of this as well. I don't wanna leave out Europe, but um, uh, during my lifetime, the US and Japan have gone from the lowest point of being bitter enemies in the Pacific War to being uh, majestic partners in the creation of a prosperous and peaceful world and Asia. Uh, that is a tremendous uh, transformation. And um, I think that um, both countries, now what's happened in my lifetime is that America has gone from being the great power of the world, a hegemon, uh, to being a country that um, is now in decline, sharp decline. And Japan has gone from being a defeated uh, third world country to becoming the most equitable, safe country, stable country in the world. There's been a, a reversal in roles of sort. And um, the two countries remain the first and third largest economies in the world. And the world needs them to collaborate. And for Japan, uh, it's critical for Japan to sustain one or 2% growth rate a year. And to do that, they need to embrace, adopt, utilize digital technology. And that's so uh, one thing that our group, the Silicon Valley Japan platform is trying to help Japan to do. And the United States worried now about Chinese uh, ambitions to become the dominant technology power in the world needs to collaborate with Japan in digital technology because of the Japanese strengths in semiconductors and in manufacturing hardware the combination of Japanese uh, excellence in the difficult areas of hardware and American uh, brilliance in software platforms means that if they can collaborate in say the creation of a cloud infrastructure or a platform for cybersecurity um, uh, or uh, norms and standards for telecommunications, 5G, 6G, and uh, uh, quantum computing down the road. My God, um, uh, the, the, the Chinese challenge will fall short if the US and Japan and, and Europe can collaborate in this space of digital technology. So, so you're was, giving us a little taste right now of the kind of work that Silicon Valley Japan platform is doing, right? Well, we're trying to, you know, uh, one of the things that I experienced at Stanford uh, early on was um, the failure for Silicon Valley and Japan to communicate and to collaborate uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. And I thought it was such a missed opportunity uh, for both countries. And I was afraid that um, that, that, that failure to connect would continue to be the case in the future as China was uh, looming large, as South Korea was coming in, Singapore, Taiwan, but not Japan, that uh, we formed this group. Um, and uh, many of my former students are uh, part of the mainstay of this group. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect Silicon Valley entrepreneurship and innovation with Japanese um, hardware and uh, scale manufacturing. Uh, and that uh, combination we think uh, is uh, critical for the future of both countries and the world.
Well, one of your key collaborators with uh, SBJP is James Higa, and he's actually following your interview today. We've, we've had ah. also an interview with him. So we'll hear a little bit back to back uh, from James as well. Yes, absolutely. So I hate to interrupt here, but we do have a couple of questions and we promised that we would make save a little bit of time. So this question, or actually a common end question comes from Yasuo Tanabe. Uh, Yasuo Tanabe says, thank you very much for your kindness to me and my family. So there's a friendship there, it appears. Um, you have advised many Japanese and Asian students at Stanford. What is your impression about them as compared with American students? How do they differ? Yes. Um... The Japanese students that have come here, like Yasuo Tanabe, have been uh, the cream of the crop. I mean, it's uh, kind of unfair to compare uh, these uh, brilliant uh, graduate students uh, to uh, uh, the larger population of American students. Um, they, what, but what I have found is that um, their level of education training uh, in the basic uh, uh, sciences, mathematics, the STEM areas is excellent. Um, where um, Japanese education needs to revitalize itself is in the area of, of uh, creative invention and that means um, asking questions, uh, tolerating unconventional ideas and uh, people. Um, it means uh, uh, a more pluralistic approach, incorporation of women in uh, that whole world of technology, for example. Um, so um, yes, in the basic, areas of education, I think uh, the Japanese graduate students who come here are excellent. Um, and um, I we think- have one more. I need to squeeze in just one more. Yes, 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 <laughs> if please. If you don't mind. Okay. So this one comes from uh, Philip Lipsy and uh, very appreciative of your talk. And the, the question is, um, you've reminded him of this memoir, American in Disguise. Do you have any plans for an update or a new memoir? <laughs> I hope so, said Philip. <laughs> yes, uh, you know. That, uh, that will be our last question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, and thank you, Yasuo, for your questions. Uh, I uh, truly uh, treasure the experiences I had with both of you. Um, yes, I am uh, working on a manuscript, uh, which is going to deal with my life with Michiko. Um, and uh, I, um, I want to, uh, uh, to focus on uh, my marrying a Japanese, which I thought I would never do, and her marrying a Japanese American, which she never imagined uh, <laughs> doing. And Michiko coming from a very aristocratic background, my coming from a very uh, pedestrian or peasant background, and um, we're yet extremely compatible, happy together, uh, very similar uh, in our tastes, in our perceptions, in our uh, values, uh, in our sense of humor. So uh, I am going to focus on a kind of a microcosm of US-Japan relations in our marriage. <laughs> and Michiko has been my best and most trusted colleague in the USJC and in the SVJP. Uh, without her, you know, I would not be uh, as involved and certainly uh, not as uh, energetically uh, uh, committed to these areas because Michiko has been my, my colleague and my trusted partner in, uh, this is a lovely Denver. way to end our time with you, Dan. <laughs> we are going to have to wrap because we have another uh, program that is immediately following, but we really want to thank you very much for your time, your stories, uh, really enjoyed it. 
and we'd like to thank everyone who's tuned in for joining us today also. Your support of USJC and programs like this have enabled to the continuation of high quality programming. Once this webinar concludes, you're going to be redirected to a brief survey and we'd really appreciate your thoughts on today. And also please don't forget to stay tuned for USJC board member James Higa immediately following on YouTube premiere. Uh, the link is in the chat and we're told that James is actually joining us and will be with us live in chat. So please stay tuned, okay? Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks again, Dan.